Welcome to D-Listers of History Sidebar. My name is Vega. I'm a public historian and tour guide. And our sidebars are a little like mini episodes where we talk about the history around some sort of current event. And the current event I picked today is, is kind of local, but kind of international. So what we're talking about today is the Kensington clean out in Philadelphia as part of the larger opioid crisis. Come with me. You could come with me. The opioid epidemic has been big news in the United States for a really long time. At this point, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who wasn't impacted by the epidemic, whether it's their own struggles with addiction, the struggles of a loved one, or if they're a chronic pain patient who is finding it increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to get their necessary treatment. Living in Philadelphia, it can kind of feel like I'm at ground zero for that epidemic sometimes. I mean, I've seen people kind of riding out their high in the shadow of Independence Hall. I've seen people use on public transportation. But the fact of the matter is, the place that is sort of the central spot for this epidemic is the neighborhood of Kensington. And it has become known internationally as ground zero for the opioid epidemic because, frankly, of a bunch of TikTokers who decided to go get content by videoing people without their consent. It was pretty gross. Uh, but as a result, we're pretty famous, unfortunately, for that. We have a new mayor. Her name's Sherelle Parker. And Sherelle Parker promised to do something about what's been going on in Kensington. So the something that she decided to do was in spite of many different people like harm reduction activists and uh, charities that work in Kensington, and just all social workers, that sort of thing. In spite of all of those people's recommendations, she decided to do a clean out, as it were, of one part of the neighborhood in Kensington that is sort of the uh, main encampment. And she she did it. So they showed up at 7 a.m., dismantled the encampment about an hour before they said they were going to. So unfortunately there weren't any social workers or anybody there to assist the people who were being moved. That said, the city claims that there were a number of people who took the opportunity to receive treatment. So hopefully that is the case. But nonetheless, most of the people who they cleared out have just sort of ended up somewhere else nearby. There's no doubt that the issue of having an open air drug market basically is a really complex issue. And it's going to require some sort of multifaceted solution. Like I'm glad, I'm glad it's not my decision to figure out how to fix that problem. But I am a historian, so I can tell you this isn't Philadelphia's first brush with a neighborhood overrun with addiction and death. In the mid 20th century, there was a 20 square block area just north of Market Street called Skid Row. A sociologist from Temple University named L Leonard Bloomberg called the area the intersection of liquor and poverty because the drug of choice in those days was alcohol. The neighborhood was filled with cheap rooming houses, bars, uh, sort of church charity outreach organizations, and cigar stores. Cigar stores didn't just sell tobacco products. Cigar stores were more like the sort of general stores you see all up and down the Northeast of the United States. So depending on where you live, they might be called pappy stores, bodegas, corner stores, whatever. In this context, they're cigar stores. So you can get pretty much anything there. And the last thing that Skid Row had was a lot of police just outside Skid Row to make sure nobody left. In 1959, the median annual income in Skid Row was just under $1,000, which in today's money, which is always a little bit of a touchy thing, just doing a one-to-one, -one, but it works for today. Uh, it's, it comes out to around $10,000 a year today. So people were really struggling. And that meant that if they were looking for a way to escape their lives through alcohol, even the prices at the incredibly inexpensive bars in Skid Row sometimes were beyond their reach. For those people, there were a number of non-beverage solutions. 
one of the popular drinks was called Squeeze or Pink Lady. How Pink Lady was made was by purchasing Sterno, which is like that canned heat stuff that you see at like a like a wedding buffet or whatever. And they would squeeze out the solids, leaving just the liquids, which includes uh, methanol, which is wood alcohol. And they would mix it with either water or cola to make it palatable. I don't know how palatable it really was, but that was what they did. The popularity of this drink meant that when 31 people died in Skid Row suddenly over the Christmas holiday, they suspected Pink Lady, especially when it was found that those people died of wood alcohol poisoning. That said, regular Sterno doesn't contain enough methanol to cause wood alcohol poisoning. It's about 3.5%, at least back in those days. I don't know what it is now. Don't drink Sterno, please. <laughs> please. Uh, but the people who had died, most of them, if not all of them, they had found a different can near them. Industrial strength Sterno contained 57% methanol. So plenty of methanol to be toxic. It was estimated that about five cigar stores in Skid Row sold these Sterno cans. Uh, it was a bit of a risky thing for them to do because it was not permitted. One of those cigar stores was owned by a man named Max Feinberg. There's no question that Max Feinberg knew what people were using the Sterno for. Customers would walk up to him and ask, can you make one? And he would go behind the counter and pull out a can of Sterno, which he called shoe polish. So like, dude knew what he was doing. Just before Christmas though, Feinberg got a shipment of Sterno that was in fact industrial strength Sterno. The packaging on the outside was the same, but once you opened it, the actual cans were clearly marked as being a different product, including a skull and crossbones on them. But he claimed in court that he didn't realize that it was different from what he would normally get. He sold about 390 of these seven ounce cans and they were sold at two cans for 29 cents. Feinberg in the end was charged with five convictions of involuntary manslaughter and a violation of the Pennsylvania Pharmacy Act. Now, some of that got backed up in appeal, but he did end up imprisoned for about four years. Skid Row, such as it was, doesn't exist anymore in Philadelphia, at least not in that location. And this wasn't due to some wonderful city program that we can now copy to maybe solve our problems today in places like Kensington. Unfortunately, the thing that made Skid Row no longer a thing was uh, the Vine Street Expressway. A highway was put through the neighborhood. It is now part of the federal highway system, I-676. So unfortunately, not a lot of solutions there. But I still think it's worthwhile to look at other moments in history when we've had similar issues and saw what dangers existed, what we should be paying attention to, that sort of thing. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today at the Listeners of History. If you enjoyed yourself, please like, subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast, uh, give us a follow and leave us a review, um, ring the bell, all that stuff. We appreciate you being here. A big thank you to all of our patrons. We couldn't do this without you. If you are interested in what we do here at Delicious of History, you can head over to our website, www.deliciousofhistory.com to learn more about all of our social media channels. We have a sub stack where you can kind of keep the conversation going, that sort of thing. Our next episode will be coming out Monday, the 27th of May. And that will be one of our longer biography episodes looking at the history of the sewing machine in the context of the Industrial Revolution. I'm really excited about this one because my co-host, Mizal, is taking the reins. And so uh, it's going to be super fun. And I'm really excited. She's been doing a lot, of, a lot of research to get ready. And I'm excited to see what she brings to the table. Um, so thank you so much. And now for an episode that I'll link to audio drop. 
mid-morning on a shimmering spring day, Kensington in Allegheny, a notorious drug corner with a grimy national reputation, stands clean. First police and then cleanup crews advance on the homeless encampment in the early morning, moving people and their belongings off the block. What remained was tossed. We're not bad people either. We just have problems. And, you know, if you want to move everybody, put them somewhere. Don't just move, ship them from one block to another.